Right, hello and sorry for the delay uh, and good to have a woman finally in this series. <laughs> At last. <laughs> At last, At last, yeah. This is part, part 8 of the series and we did the first 7 talks with only men in the audience. So. <laughs> So, yeah, mm, special welcome. <laughs> uh, anyway, you recapitulate. <laughs> yes. So, um, as a recap, today we are going to be speaking around, uh, speaking about fluidity as, uh, as, an, as a container of the feminine, if you were to call it that. Yeah. So, we started this series speaking about the the, the anima and the animus as, as psychology understands the feminine and the masculine uh, as to how. So, there is a spiritual understanding of what it means to access the feminine and the masculine. There is a psychological understanding, there is also a biological understanding. So, we have been dealing with the series from various perspectives, how, what each of these, these mean for us. Uh, and along the way, we have also spoken of the fact that biologically, yes, there, there is the aspect of sex which is biologically male or biologically female or sometimes mixed and that there is little that we can do about that. That is uh, an accident of birth and that there is not that there is not much choice there. However, when we speak of the gender of feminine and masculine, that is a sociological construct. It is something that we are conditioned to believe and that is something that we can do a lot about. Right? And therefore, when we are talking of accessing the feminine, we are speaking of uh, this from the perspective that somehow over millennia human, the human race as a whole has chosen for some reason to access more of the masculine and less of the feminine and we are at a juncture where we are trying to balance, bring the balance back. So, what we hear of as the rise of the feminine in many ways, we are hearing of it in various circles politically, socially, in movies and all of that. So, the rise is not so much about the rise of the feminine replacing the masculine, but really uh, bringing it both at par so that we have a equ fairly equitable balance. And very importantly, bringing the choice in the balance that both energies are equally important. It is as important to be masculine as to be feminine. And where do we therefore, how do we therefore choose to access both of these energies as and when needed. So, along the way we have looked at the, the feminine uh, from various perspectives, from the idea of gender, from the idea of psychology and how Carl Jung speaks of the development of the feminine on the planet in the human race. Uh, we have also been speaking uh, in the last few talks about how do we start accessing the feminine, how do we look at various tools to access the feminine. So, uh, we said in one of the previous talks that what holds the feminine, what, what's the key to the feminine energy, whether you speak of it psychologically or spiritually or otherwise, the key to the feminine is, the pre is presence. Okay? The feminine resides in the here and now, it does not have the linearity of a timeline. Right? So, therefore, it is not about being in the past or being in the future, but here and now, what is it? that we can do and being completely present physically, mentally, emotionally in this moment is what gives us access to the feminine and then we can choose what to do with it or whether to access it at all, but it gives us access. Right? So, presence in that sense is the key and presence opens up uh, three very critical uh, gifts of the feminine if you were to call it that. One of it is wholeness, the fact that the feminine presence allows us equal access to both the masculine and the feminine energies in that it brings us whole. It allows us to choose whatever parts of us we want to work with in that moment. Today we are going to be speaking about the second gift which is fluidity. Okay, you may call it fluidity, flexibility, whatever you wish. So, the idea of fluidity and I have drawn the definition from this book called Shakti Leadership, uh, where they say that flu fluidity or flexibility, Shakti yes. So, it uh, is a very interesting uh, take on conscious leadership, uh, 
focused on the corporate space but also leadership in various aspects of society, social leadership, peace leadership, economic leadership or even family or personal leadership in general. So uh, what the book speaks about is how do we bring back the feminine given that we have been taught to access the masculine in many ways, how do we also start accessing the feminine so that we live in a space of balance. So how uh, the authors define fluidity or flexibility there is that it is a capacity to switch modes very seamlessly right? and to bend without breaking pretty much the way a bamboo does, it is it's strong, it is tall, it is hard and yet it can bend with the wind right? and that is the only reason why the bamboo survives, it can bend as much as it needs to no matter how strong the winds and even in a storm where a lot of other trees and plants perish, the bamboo pretty much survives. So what we mean by fluidity therefore is how do we stay in presence and stay in our context in a strong enough way and yet choose to access one or the other parts of us without having a strong preference towards one. Because a preference towards one also means that we are losing out on the strength of the other part that we may have. Right? So these parts in effect could be the masculine or the feminine parts of us, it could also be other parts of us. So for example, we may speak of parts from the perspective of the inner parent and the inner child and if, if there is a strong preference for the inner parent, <coughs> we lose out on, on the fun and the lighter aspects of life that the child may bring. Right? So it could be inner man and inner woman, it could be inner, uh, inner boss and inner subordinate, any, any of those parts, various parts of us that we deal with and the fl idea of fluidity is to be able to seamlessly move through all of those parts as and when needed and make sure we access the strengths of all those parts and not leave any of those unattended. And why is uh, fluidity important as an aspect of the feminine is we are living in an increasingly polarized world, right? We see that through terrorism, we see that through money and what is happening to money around the world in various markets. We are seeing that through gender issues that are cropping up around the world. So there is a lot of polarity that is being brought up to the surface. Uh, the US presidential elections are in a way bringing out polarity in, at various levels. It is talking of polarity between man and woman, it is talking about ideologies, it is talking of Muslim and anti-Muslim, it is bringing up all sorts of polarities in that sense. And I would believe it is not only bringing that up for the US, it is bringing it up for the rest of the world because pretty much everybody is engaged in that conversation. and pretty much everybody will be impacted by that conversation. I mean, even you and me sitting here on the other part of the world will have an, will be impacted by who is the president there because policies are going to change, attitudes are going to change. So it is not, it, it happens to be in the U US, it does not really mean it is restricted to the US and the polarity, yes and therefore the polarity is for everybody to reflect on in terms of what is, what do we do about it. So among the various polarities that we as a race are dealing with at this point is one religion versus, uh, I have put it as humanism, what I mean is the non-religious aspect of it. So not sticking to a parochial identity but opening up our identity as human beings and therefore as globalized citizens. So we could also look at it as nationalists versus non-nationalist then therefore world citizen kind of a view. Yeah. There is of course the polarity of materialism and spiritualism that has been constantly brought up in various ways in our lives. Uh, various other polarities that we lo lo deal with on a day to day basis, should I look at something from a short term perspective or a long term perspective, I mean, should I invest short term, should I go long term, should I look at a job opportunity as a short term benefit, should I look for a long term career. Those are decisions we ca come to uh, face pretty much every day of our lives. 
there is of course the polarity in terms of how much do I do for self as compared to how much do I do for society around me. <coughs> do I choose my, my career, my education, my life partner, my job because I want it or because society expects me to. And of course, underlying all of this is the fundamental polarity of what's right and what's wrong. Because of conflict. Yes, I, I, right or wrong. If, for me, in my language, that is about moral and immoral. And uh, at the end, end of it, is morality essential at all? That that's a question that we all need to look at because there is, of course, the idea of ethics, which is essential in the sense that. Ethics is about not harming another in the process of living my life. In a broad sense, not harming the society. Yes, society or anybody else. And anybody ethics, else. therefore, would also mean that I'm not harming myself, right? right? So it's about the choice. Ethics for me is about the li choice between life and anything that harms life. Right? Morality, on the other hand, is a social construct. Again, we've somehow managed to construct it, and we've constructed it in order to control. Right? And therefore, when we talk of morality, morality always expresses itself as control in terms of you, you cannot wear these clothes or you, you cannot have that relationship or any of those aspects which are very restrictive and controlling in nature and it serves the interest of some, it does not serve the interest of some, some others. And morality has come up as, um, as a fallout of the need to hold on to the masculine energy at a larger level and the masculine energy at a larger level is about structure and control and okay. domination and morality is a byproduct of that and we are at a time and space as, as a world that we, we are reflecting on the need for morality do we really need that amount of control and restriction over another it's not morality is never about self it's always about another. So, in, in this polarized context where the world as a unit is being asked to look at where are we going and what are we doing, fluidity becomes very important. So, fluidity is about shifting the space from, from polarity to paradox, to, to understand the fact that if we continue to live in polarity, which means we continue to live with a belief that some things are right, some things are wrong, someone is stronger, someone is weaker, uh, something is logical, something is not. Right? If, we, if we are living in that world of either or, this or that, we will continue to live in polarity and therefore we will continue to only access one part of ourselves, one part of our energy which is acceptable according to the world around. Will that be living completely? No, it won't because at, at any given point in time you will be forced to make one choice and leave the other and the other may contain a lot of good things, a lot of strengths. Right? And what happens if we choose to live with polarity is that energy gets cancelled along the way. Right? If I choose to be more masculine than le and less feminine, somewhere I'm, I'm losing out on the benefits of the feminine and the masculine is overworking and in that process energy is cancelled. Right? The, the ancient American Indians have this story of how uh, uh, of the one winged eagle and there's this eagle that it flies but it flies only with one right wing and the left wing is folded up. Right? And what happens because of that is it flies, but it flies in circles because there's only one wing flapping. So anytime it moves, it cancels its own energy. It can't move forward. And only when the eagle learns that I have to use both wings and it extends the other wing that it realizes, okay, I can soar and go forward now. It's not flying in circles anymore. And what polarity does is it forces us to fly with one wing. And that's really not enough as, as an energy space. So the movement that we are looking at and presence is in a way the key to this movement, a facilitator to this shift that instead of polarity, we also have a choice to live with paradox, to accept the fact that 
the world that we live in, the, the, the universe that we live in is made of paradoxes. So, there is matter and there is antimatter, there is the north pole and the south pole, there is positive and the negative. And can we co-hold it instead of having to choose one over the other? Right? Uh, because uh, in, in the space of polarity, what we are doing is constantly saying, no, only one of it can be correct, the other has to be wrong. And therefore, we are losing out on one half of our existence. The space of paradox is about co-holding, which also means therefore, uh, that it is not entirely logical in the way we know logic. It is also intuitive. Right? Uh, it has a neutral charge in the sense, in a world of paradox, we are not saying one is right and the other is wrong. We are saying that this exists and this exists. Light exists as much as shade does. Right? And both are equally necessary. Imagine if we had sun 24 hours a day, the planet would not have survived. We would have burnt up at some point. The, day, the night is as essential as the day is. Right? And to be able to hold that with that neutral charge that both are equally important and necessary. And therefore, in terms of language, living in paradox would mean shifting the language from either or to and. That this is possible, so is that. It is okay to be a man and a woman. It is it's okay to be an employer and an employee. It is okay to be strong and to be weak both of it. Okay. So, paradoxes release energy, it gives you more energy to work with because there is choices it that come. Choices. Yeah, it increases the amount of choices and therefore, there is more that you can work with. Right. And therefore, the language then also shifts from right or wrong to saying, in this moment, this is what I choose, in the next moment, I might shift. Useful, not Yes, what, what serves life in this moment? Yes. Yeah. So, useful, yeah, in, 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 the, in that sense, when we say useful in this context of paradox, it is about is it enriching life, is it alienating life? Yes, I mean, uh, yeah. suppose stealing is wrong, hmm. uh, we may call it as per yes. rule. Yeah. But if you see, it is useful or not useful. Hmm. Not useful in terms of long term. Yes. Imprisonment, your own yes. career and everything. So, yeah. it is not useful. Yeah. It may be, hmm. at that time, it may be useful to save somebody's life. Yes. You may steal some uh, document. Hmm. Suppose, because of forcefully he has taken it. Yes. And you have, uh, you have uh, taken that document without his knowledge. Yeah. So, it is a stealing. Hmm. But it is useful for somebody else. Yeah. So, it is good. And yes. So, therefore, not applying the morality principle right. there and saying you know, all stealing is bad. Right. It's about saying that, okay, if I'm stealing bread because I need food, food yeah. maybe it serves me and it's not particularly harming anybody. Right. Yeah. So, in that moment, if I steal food from somebody, is it starving the other person? May not be. I mean, maybe the other person has excess lying around and therefore, I can feed myself. Is it a sustainable long term way of living? No, it is not. I need to find alternatives, but in that moment, it serves me and it does not harm another. Right? And, and that is the paradox of saying that, did I do anything wrong? I mean, if I have to look at it from the long term sustainable point of view, yeah, stealing is not the way to live. Am I capable of stealing? Very much. <laughs> right? do, can I choose to use that capability in this moment? Perhaps yes, if it helps me and does not harm another. Right? And the paradox is about saying that yes, I choose it in this moment and yet I choose not to do it through the rest of my life. Right? It is not something that I want to make a lifestyle out of and yet it is something that serves me now. And that is the space of paradox to co-hold the fact that there is a thief in me as much as there is a generous giver in me. Yes? Uh, you. You. <laughs> because again, the, the feminine principle and the idea of presence is that your power is in you and you are not waiting for the external <coughs> construct to decide. Yeah, maybe easy option, stealing. Mm -hmm. As you, we, you also know, long term it may not, because every time then you have to 
And therefore, so when we say presence is the facilitator, what we mean is there is a consciousness that comes with presence. So I'm not mindlessly stealing. I'm, I'm aware of the fact that I'm stealing in that moment. And I'm aware of the consequences of it. Depends. This better option may be there. I may not know. Mm -hmm. I have. Yes. The stealing is one way or yeah. what I look around or mm -hmm. maybe there may be better yeah. way also to deal. Very possible that when we, when we deal from presence, Yes, I may come across stealing as one option. I may also come across begging as another. I may go across and request somebody and say, hey, I'm hungry, give me food. Or sometimes you, see, there is a saying, I will put it, the, what you ask from life, no, you get. Yes. But to Maybe come to that, that realization, I need to be in a constant state of presence that if I'm, if I'm going with an assumption that stealing is the only option, then it's not serving my life. You know, sometimes right? there is no choice. Because, yeah. Because, uh, you, as you told about eagle example, you hmm. may be moving in that direction. Yes. Only. And one more I would like to ask about paradox. In hmm? Shakespeare's, uh, Shakespeare's play, hmm? there is a line to be or not to be. Yeah. We are caught in that dilemma. Yes. So yeah. We would like to add or emphasis something. Uh, to me, the, the, that statement of to be or not to be is, is the expression of the paradox that life is constantly about that choice. Should I be or not to be in this moment? And it's not a one-time choice. It's a choice you make every moment. In some senses, Shakespeare captured the essence of life in that statement. I mean, in this moment, should I be not to be? Should I be a thief? Should I not be a thief? Should I be a murderer? Should I not be a murderer? Should I be a leader? Should I not be a leader? Or he may be talking about choices. Yeah, and the fact that it's like every moment is a series of choices and what choice do we make in every moment? How do we hold the paradox in every moment? Right? So the shift that we are uh, looking at here is the shift from the polarity consciousness to the paradox consciousness which says that the, the underlying belief about living does not have to be this or that, but this and that and what I choose and that that's where my power comes in and therefore nobody else can make that choice for you. We are not dependent on external laws or authority or government or any of that, but to assume that power within oneself and claim that. Which also means that in the longer run, we were looking at aspiring towards a world where there's a lot of ownership of life and stewardship of life. In many ways, come to think of it, in not a lot of us assume ownership of our lives the way we are currently living. Right? A lot of what we decide on, what a lot of the choices we make are ascribed to our parents, to, to, to law, to our society, to the country we are born in and a whole lot of that. So it's about saying, okay, my life in, is in a certain way because India offers a certain infrastructure or I, I'm working, working in a certain job because my parents put me through college in this particular way or any of that, right? Yeah, so here, here's an invitation to say how much of that can you own, how much of life, your life belongs to you and are you willing to be responsive for, responsible for that? Because it, it, living in a paradox comes with a huge sense of responsibility that what happens to you is because of you, not because of anybody else. And which is why... Uh, over millennia, there has been a lot of fear around the feminine principle and the fear around the rising feminine because it means that there are no more institutions to take blame. It means you're living from the core of your power and your strength and that there's no one outside there. And hence the fear that I'm responsible. <laughs> but. There's also the beauty of the fact that I am responsible and therefore I can create what I wish to create. So uh, it's a huge shift that we are, shift of consciousness that we are aspiring to with this conversation. And even as we speak, the shift seems to be happening in the world. There are more and more 
pockets around the world where people are taking ownership in terms of creating more sustainable communities, there are alternative fuels that are being spoken about, there are people that are replanting forests around the world, uh, that there are governments that are starting to operate very differently around the world and bringing in a lot more sense of ownership and responsibility onto the common man, the common citizen. So, and even if we look at a lot of peace building initiatives around the world, more and more work is happening not at the level of the UN and the governments and diplomats, but at the level of citizens. So, this shift is happening even as we are speaking about it. The idea is to look at how do we make it happen within our lives quicker and accelerate the process for the rest of the world as well. So, there is an interesting uh, tool called uh, polarity mapping which uh, Dr. Barry Johnson had, uh, uh, had initiated. Uh, so, he is a creator of polarity thinking and polarity mapping as we know it. Uh, of course, but he did not intend it for a particular purpose, it was a general framework which can be adapted to various uh, ways. So, what uh, Dr. Johnson speaks about in polarity thinking is that in a polarized world where we look at either or, uh, one yes there is a choice of either or this or that right and the other is that the, those choices can be made consciously or unconsciously. By consciously what he means is in presence, in complete awareness of the fact that I am making this choice by will and unconsciously is by default that you know, it's, ha it's happened and I am not aware of it, it just happened. It's, it's like you know, if, if I were to ask you which shoe did you wear first before coming here, the left one or the right one, you, you probably do not remember, right? It, it, it's unconscious, it happened and it's happened perhaps by habit. Maybe if you go back home and reflect on it, you might discover that you have a habit of putting one leg first and then the other, right? But it's unconscious, it's done by default and you've not uh, in that sense, there has been no free will choice around it, it it's happened, right. Or a choice of, if I were to ask you, uh, how many of you sent your children to school willfully, right. I mean, you made a choice between sending your child to school and not sending your child to school and then said, okay, I am willfully sending my choice, child to school. A lot of times that choice is unconscious that everybody goes to school. So, of course, a child has to go to school when he is two and a half, three, four, right. So, everybody, because everybody does it, right. So, it, it, that becomes an unconscious choice. So, the, there's, the, there's a very clear distinction between the two there. So, here what we have plotted is the left side is the feminine and the right is the masculine. I, if I were to explain the tool uh, in a simpler manner, if, if we were to let us say, Look at um, breathing, for example, as a simple thing that we all connect with. Right? There's in breathing you have inhale and exhale. That there are two processes to it. Right? So, if I were to, in a polarized context, say that I like inhale more than I like exhale. Right? So I prefer inhalation. Right? What would be the benefit of inhaling? Yeah. Yeah. So, I keep getting energy, I keep getting in oxygen, right. So, there is a benefit to it. However, if I do too much of inhaling, mm -hmm. I keep only inhaling, I do not exhale enough, what could happen? Okay. Yeah, the, there is a build up of toxicity, I am <laughs> building up carbon dioxide and not willing to release it, right. Yeah, at some point my system will collapse, right. On the other hand, if I were to say I love exhaling and therefore I am going to do a lot of that, what would the benefits be? The benefits would be that I will end up detoxing myself because I will get the carbon dioxide out, but if I do too much of that, there is practically no energy to live with, right. It becomes completely draining. So, what Johnson says is that anything that you look at from a polarity lens has both benefits and uh, deficiencies or uh, 
non benefits <laughs> in that sense. So, if I choose to only inhale at some point I am going to get toxic and I won't be able to sustain. Similarly, if I only exhale, I will not be able to work with it. Okay? And therefore, at some point, I need to learn the dance between inhaling and exhaling, which means live in the top quadrant, live in the conscious quadrant where I know when to inhale and when to exhale and make sure they are in equal proportion and not slip down to the lower unconscious plane where I hold on without really being conscious of what else can happen and in the process give up my life either way, either because I have not inhaled or because I have not exhaled. Okay. So, similarly if you were to look at the feminine and the masculine being mapped through this tool, uh, in general the gifts that the feminine brings, uh, if you were to look at it from the psychological lens. The feminine aspect of us, whether we are a man or a woman, it is the feminine part of us that brings in empathy, it brings in vulnerability, it brings in uh, the sense of inclusion, it brings in creativity, right? uh, trust, openness, vulnerability and all of that. So, there are a lot of gifts that the feminine brings. However, if we stay too much in the feminine, at some point that vulnerability becomes weakness. Right? If, if at some point I will, it is all right to feel vulnerable in a situation and express my emotions, but if all I am doing is that, then I am a crybaby and I am not really useful to the world or to myself for that matter. At some point I might get too needy, too sentimental, too dependent, too uh, smothering to some extent where I, where I lose the creativity, I, I become possessive at the end of it. Right? So, and possessive and some a lot of times manipulative because I want to retain that state of victimhood. Right? So, too much of the feminine does not serve either. Right? And that happens when I am in the unconscious state of the feminine, where the feminine is not awakened or utilized consciously, then it is very manipulative, it is not very useful. Similarly, if you were to look at the gifts of the masculine, the, ma the masculine brings in a lot of focus, a lot of clarity. Uh, it is the masculine part of us that affords structure and order in life, the sense of discipline, the sense of maintaining frame. health, life, the, the, the frame that holds life is the masculine principles and, and that is very important. Right? However, if we stay too much in that and as a collective we have stayed too much in that, the excess of the masculine then causes aggression. Somewhere the assertiveness that the masculine brings turns into aggression because there is too much of it. The, the, the leadership that the masculine brings at some point becomes domination and then it becomes violent if there is too much of it. Yes, it becomes control without reason. Right? So, there is a lot of insensitivity, there is a lot of hunger for power that the masculine, excess of the masculine brings. Right? And uh, in many ways, if we have to look at various uh, pockets of our lives where we have lived unconsciously, we have somewhere danced this dance, the unconscious dance where there is a part of us feeling like a victim because the other part has been a dom dominant persecutor, there is a part of it that feels dependent because the other part is taking on too much of a burden and so on and that is the unconscious dance. And the idea is to come into the conscious dance where you are dancing between the conscious feminine and the conscious masculine where there is openness, there is fluidity, but there is also structure and there is a frame and purpose to life. There is vulnerability, but there is also discipline. Yeah, it becomes flow. Yeah, there is a flow. So, it is pretty much like if you have a river, the bank of the river is as essential as the river itself. Right? And the feminine principle in general is the river, it, it flows. Right? But if it flows without banks, there is a flood and then the river is no longer useful, it is destructive. Right? So, the banks need to hold the river in a way that the river becomes useful and life serving in any manner that it can be. Right? And therefore, the conscious dance between the polarities is, is, is about living with that paradox that we will 
in our world, in our universe, have the feminine principle and the masculine principle, how do we co-hold the two and choose when to access what without doing too much of one than the other. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, a lot of our uh, education and socialization has has taught us a lot about the masculine in terms of how to be assertive, how to be structured, how to go through a 15 year education curriculum, how to, you know, how to choose a job logically and all of that. We have not really been taught how to explore life, how to sometimes take decisions intuitively, how to look at, uh, how to include art, how to include music and joy in our lives. That, that, that's something that some individuals choose, a lot of us don't choose because we just don't have the time and the time, our time has been structured according to the masculine side of us. And so now the idea is to bring in that yeah, balance. In Canada, I have seen even in corporate and all you, too much planning yeah. and too much structured program yes. will lose the chances of spontaneity. Yeah, and there is yeah, absolutely no spontaneity uh, left sometimes. Yeah. Of, uh, yes. Yeah. Creativity gets killed if there's too much of structure. So, while it's lovely and great to have documentation and processes and systems and all of that, within that structure, there needs to be some fluidity to allow for the human to emerge. Broad, broadly, it's okay. I mean, yeah. Just because uh, hmm. otherwise it will deviate too yeah. much. So the structure is very essential to hold the purpose of the organization. Every organization exists for a particular reason and that structure needs to very much be held to be in integrity with the organization. But within that, to acknowledge the fact that we are working with human beings and not just a resource that is supposed to be plugged in and plugged out and to respect the fact that there is life in the organization that also needs to thrive is, is essential. Many a time in sales, I see they will have so many forms mm. structured and oh, yes. do this. So the yeah. whole time goes into filling Absolutely. up. Absolutely. don't have something, na, yeah. they are fabricating. Yeah. And so oh, yes. you lose the actual yeah. purpose. Yeah. And which is what is happening, uh, I mean, if you look at, if you talk of the job context, that's true for pretty much every job, right? The amount of paperwork that, that becomes essential, at some point, the people descend into the space where they are filling in reports, but they are filling in mindless things in the report just because it needs to be filled there and the, the data loses all meaning, right? And, they, and it's no longer useful because somewhere the, the structure has become a dominant thing and then you lose the other pole in the process. And also gives too much importance to those forms. Yeah. So that, that's where the, somewhere as a world we've created a lot of this space and now the idea is to learn how to dance with the other pole and to stay in that space of paradox that there will always be both. How do we co-hold the two? Okay. So in order to cultivate fluidity, here are a few questions for reflections that you might want to take back. Uh, so, we have spoken of the pole in the context of the masculine and the feminine. You may use these questions to reflect on any polarities in your life, whether it is uh, saving versus spending or it is uh, health as in you know, gymming and exercise versus rest or uh, you know, entertainment versus something else. So, various polarities in our lives that we look at, whether it is giving in, into a relationship or being dominant. So, there are always polarities that we are battling every day. So, few questions to look at. What is your preferred pole? Is there a default position that you get into? Because And that default position sometimes because you do so much of that default, it becomes a comfort zone. Every we have this yeah. We, we have it in pretty much every aspect of our life, yeah. yeah. So, what is the preferred pole, right? And what do I do about it? Is the preferred pole serving me or is it just convenient and comfortable for the moment and therefore others expect it from me and therefore I am in that pole? What is the reality about your preferred pole? What are the positive qualities of the other pole? 
right? So if I'm too much of a spender and I don't save enough, what are the positives of saving? And how can I very slowly start accessing those benefits? It's not about saying I've got to stop spending and go to the other extreme, but how, what are the benefits and which of those benefits can I start accessing little by little? What are my early warning signs if I unconsciously start to polarize again? So, if at some point just by force of habit I start to spend more again, how do I know it so that I can bring myself consciously back and say, okay, do I really need to spend this and not save? What are my early warning signs? So, in the context of uh, saving, early warning signs could be that maybe I have too many clothes or I've watched too many movies without necessarily wanting to or without necessarily enjoying them. Maybe I have a very cluttered house with things all around where I don't have use for everything that I own. Okay. Those could be signs which allow me to see on a day-to-day -day basis and very easily see that somewhere I'm polarized and I need to bring the balance back a little bit. And what are the action steps that I can take to avoid excessive polarizing? How, how do I make sure that I'm not spending too much? What, what kind of systems can I put in place where I say that, okay, there's either a budget for it or there's some logic to how I spend? How do I put in that poll? So the, the idea of these reflections is to bring about fluidity to because excessive of anything, any one thing is, is, is in a way energetically not serving us because we are accessing only one part of it. Right? And this could mean excess of anything including excess of exercise, excess of meditation, excess of reading, all of that is accessing one pole and it's important to start uh, accessing the strength of the other very consciously. because. Even if something is classified as so-called good, it doesn't mean too much of it is good. Right? And there are certain, in, in a masculine frame, uh, there are a lot of things that we promote as being good, that education is always good or discipline is always good. Right? So, uh, morality is always good. So, the, the, there's a lot we are taught is good, but not necessarily. And it's time to question that and look at what's, the, what's on the other side. How do I access the other side of it. The, the uh, warning, if I may, <laughs> is that yeah, if we start accessing our fluidity, people around us may initially get disturbed because they, they, we are no longer predictable. Right? They, they, yeah. Because the idea of living in the paradox is there is no predictiveness. I don't know what I'm going to do the next moment. Yeah. It's very spontaneous living and it's very conscious living, right? So the, the safety, the false safety net that the masculine principle creates when it's in excess, that everyone is predictable. I can, I know what kind of food would you want on the dinner table today, right? So that safety net is gone if you're living with, with uh, in fluidity. However, what it brings you instead is a absolute authenticity that this is who I am in this moment and that's what I'm going to live. So absolute truth to oneself, living true to oneself is something that this brings and it's essential. Right? So that's fluidity and as you're embarking on this dance, prepare to disturb a few people around you. Hacks, hmm. exercise will be good in this condition. Yes, it's a lovely it's exercise a, for fluidity. All, uh, moving into different, yes. uh, yeah. So it looks at it from the thought process point of view, and how do you bring in thought fluid fluid thought process? Yes. And then yeah. making a choice. Yes. Yeah. So making a choice not just because I believe in one choice by default, but looking at everything and then saying this is what I want. Yeah. So, yep, that's what I have for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.